Hello, Mr. Hardy here, and in this video I would like to teach you about the poem Lament by Gillian Clark. So we'll start by reading Lament by Clark, and we'll then go through it stanza by stanza to understand the images she is using. Um, we'll then look at the poem's message and any areas of conflict that we can explore in the poem. We'll then go through the poem one more time, identifying the key linguistic, structural, and poetic techniques um, that Clark employs that you may want to use in your exam answer. And I'll leave you with a couple of tasks at the end of the video, including a exam style question to answer if you so desire. So who is our poet, Gillian Clark? Um, well, she's a contemporary poet, meaning she's still alive today and she deals with the issues of our time. So Clark was born in 1937 and she's still alive at the time of making this video in 2023. Um, she is a Welsh poet. She was born in Wales. I believe she still lives there. Um, and her poem Lament is an elegy. An elegy is a type of poem, a form of poem, um, that is usually used to reflect on something. Um, usually a person because they've died. So it's quite common to have an elegy at a funeral, for example, a short poem or a short reading that reflects on a, on the person who is dead and, and what they did with their life and, and what happened. Um, so Lament is an elegy about the Gulf War. So the Gulf War was a war that happened in the Middle East in the early 1990s. Um, what happened was Iraq invaded Kuwait and then... Um, the UK and the USA said, nope, that's not okay, and they got involved and they bombed Iraq. And this conflict in the Middle East uh, resulted in 100,000 deaths. Um, that could be Iraqi people, Kuwaiti uh, people, um, soldiers, innocent civilians. Um, a lot of people fell victim to this war. And 5 million people were displaced. Um, Displaced meant they, they were sort of forced out of their homes, maybe their homes were destroyed, they had to flee to another country, um, we would call that being a refugee. Um, it basically affected 5 million people's lives on top of the 100,000 who were killed. Um, now what those numbers don't tell us is that the environment was also affected by this war. The sea, um, the sun, the animals, the birds, the, the fish, and this is something that Clark explores in Lament. Um, so it's not just the effects on humans, but the effects on the natural world too. So let's have a read. Lament by Gillian Clark. For the green turtle with her pulsing burden in search of the breeding ground, for her eggs laid in their nest of sickness, for the cormorant in his funeral silk, the veil of iridescence on the sand, the shadow on the sea. For the ocean's lap with its mortal stain, for Ahmed at the closed border, for the soldier with his uniform of fire, for the gunsmith and the armourer, the boy fusilier who joined for the company, the farmer's sons in it for the music, for the hook-beaked turtles, the dugong and the dolphin, the whale struck dumb by the missile's thunder, for the tern, the gull and the restless wader, the long migrations and the slow dying, the veiled sun and the stink of anger, for the burnt earth and the sun put out, the scalded ocean and the blazing well, for vengeance and the ashes of language. So there you have it, a seven stanza poem. Um, let's go through it stanza by stanza uh, and look at the images that Clark is using. Um, so we know that a, a poet its main aim is to paint an image in the reader's mind. Now, some poems uh, paint images in a chronological order, so um, from beginning, middle to end, a bit like a story, a bit like a narrative poem. Um, Clark doesn't do that. Actually, she drew inspiration from um, newspaper cuttings of um, the war, the Gulf War, and used various images in sort of a, a snapshot format. Um, so each stanza focuses on a different image. So we'll go through the poem again stanza by stanza and look at the different images, the different photos, snapshots, if you will, that Clark is trying to put in the reader's mind. So in stanza one, Clark focuses on a pregnant sea turtle who wants to lay her eggs. Um, we know this from the phrases green turtle, pulsing burden, which refers to her pregnancy in the eggs, um, breeding ground, eggs, nest. Um, these are all clues 
um, that, that this image is surrounding a pregnant sea turtle. Stanza 2 zooms in on a cormorant. Um, a cormorant is a type of seabird, um, and in this situation the cormorant um, is closely linked with this idea of funeral. And um, We have the word funeral, veil. Um, some people wear, um, particularly women, wear a veil to cover their face for when they cry and mourn at a funeral. Um, so this image is to do with seabirds mourning an oil slick. One of the consequences of the Gulf War was that a lot of oil was spilt in the sea and the surrounding areas. In stanza three, we get three images actually. Um, the first line deals with an oil spill. The mortal stain is the oil spill. Um, the second line deals with um, a refugee, Ahmed, maybe trying to escape um, Kuwait at the border. Um, and the third line deals with a soldier suffering um, by being on fire. So I believe this was drawn from a, a real event that happened in the war. Um, there was a soldier inside of a tank and the tank was attacked by a missile um, and it caught on fire. And there's an image of a soldier literally on fire um, escaping the tank. A really horrific image. Um, stanza 4 looks at the people who get caught up in war. So we get a list of four people, a gunsmith, an armourer, a fusilier, um, and farmer's sons. Stanza 5 looks at sea creatures that are affected by the war. So we have turtles, dugongs. A dugong is like a manatee, it's like a sea cow. Um, a big creature that eats seagrass, um, very peaceful. Uh, dolphins and whales that are all affected by missiles and the consequences of war. Um, the penultimate stanza deals with birds that are caught up in the war. So again we have a list, a tern is a, a cute little seabird, a gull, I'm sure you're familiar with seagulls, um, a wader is a bird that has sort of big feet to, to swim in the water and, and try and eat fish. Um, so all of these birds they didn't start the war, they were just going about their daily lives, but they've been affected by humanity's conflict in the area. And the final stanza is um, probably the most terrifying from my point of view. Um, it deals with how war has affected the whole earth, not just the people, not just the animals, but you know, planet earth itself. Um, the earth is burnt, the sun is put out, extinguished, uh, the ocean turns hot and bubbling like it's scalded, um, a well which provides water, provides life, is, is blazing, it's on fire, um, there's vengeance, maybe humans want revenge for one another, um, the Iraqis and the Kuwaitis want vengeance, but for me, even more terrifyingly, maybe Mother Nature wants vengeance on, on humanity for all the destruction we've caused in our conflicts. And we end off with this image of the ashes of language. Now, ashes are you know, if someone dies, you cre cremate them, they become ashes, or in a war, particularly um, this Gulf War where there was lots of bombing, um, ashes are sort of the consequence of violence, and we have the ashes of language, so maybe the death of language, um, does that suggest maybe humanity dies out and the world falls silent because of our conflict? We'll unpack this a bit more as we go through the poem. So, um, what is Clark's message? Lament by Clark is a poem that laments the devastating effects of physical conflict on all forms of life. Um, now, one thing I didn't mention is that in each stanza, we have an anaphora, a repetition of the word for. Um, so in stanza one, it's for the green turtle. Um, so what you would do is you would put the title lament before the anaphora. So it would say lament for the green turtle, which means um, we are mourning the death of the green turtle. Uh, in stanza two, it's lament for the cormorant, which means we are reflecting on the death of the cormorant. Um, so this poem, it looks at all the snapshots, images of different life forms affected by um, the Gulf War, by humans' conflict. And in stanza one, we start quite zoomed in on a turtle and her eggs. It then sort of zooms out into a cormorant um, and, and a picture of a beach. It zooms out even further to the picture of the ocean, of Ahmed, of a soldier on fire. It zooms out even further to different types of people affected by the war, gunsmith, armourer, fusilier, sons. 
it zooms out even further into the ocean and the creatures that are affected, turtles, dugongs, dolphin, whales. It zooms out even further to other types of seabird affected, the tern, the gull, the wader. And at the very last stanza, we get the biggest, the widest perspective of it all, which is that human conflict could probably bring an end to the earth, the burnt earth, the sun put out, the scalded ocean, the blazing well, the ashes of language. Um, so really, Lament by Clark is a warning. Physical conflict devastates all forms of life, not just humans, but birds and plants. And if left unchecked, it could probably bring about the end to humanity on Earth, to our planet as we know it. So where do we see conflict in this poem? Um, well, we see physical conflict between Iraq and Kuwait, that's what started the Gulf War, and there's also physical conflict between um, uh, America and England getting involved with this war as well. But I think from the poem itself, I think it really looks at the conflict between humans and nature. So when humans do battle with one another, when we have conflict with other humans and other countries and other tribes, it's not just us that suffers, all of nature suffers, the birds, the sea creatures, the environment, the atmosphere, um, mother nature, the planet itself suffers because of our wars. So we have this conflict between war and the environment. The environment wants a sort of balanced, peaceful existence, but war, set in motion by humans, creates destruction and death. So, what techniques does Clark employ in her poem? Well, linguistically, there's alliteration, there's use of listing, there's personification, metaphor, and use of senses. Um, with imagery, the most common sense is sight, um, but Clark also engages smell at one point um, to good effect as well. Structurally, we've got seven stanzas. Um, they are all three-line stanzas, so we can call them tersets. Um, I mentioned that there's a zooming out effect, so stanza one starts really zoomed in on a, a turtle laying its eggs, and then we zoom out into the birds and the ocean and the people, and finally we get that big image in the final stanza, stanza seven, of a sort of apocalyptic destruction of the world because of war and conflict. We know that the poem's an elegy, so if you choose to write about this poem in your exam, you can define its form. It is an elegy. Um, and there is repetition of some key ideas, um, in particular the idea of the sea and the idea of the sun. These images get repeated throughout the poem, I think ultimately because the sea and sun are two of the most important things for sustaining human life on the planet. The sun gives us warmth, gives us light, we can grow our fruit and vegetables. The sea provides you know, water, um, you know, carbon dioxide uh, regulation, temperature regulation, so these are two very important um, parts of the natural world, which is why I believe Clark repeated them throughout her poem. Uh, poetically speaking, the number one technique is imagery. Um, Clark is really great at painting lots of different images, some very harrowing, um, to really get across that message that human conflict is not just destructive for us as a species, but for all life forms and the planet itself. We have that anaphora. Anaphora means repetition. It's a sort of poetic and persuasive technique, and the phrase that gets repeated is for, in particular for the. So when you couple that with the title of the poem, you get phrases like lament for the green turtle, lament for the cormorant, lament for the ocean's lap, etc, etc. Um, there's a little bit of assonance and sibilance. Um, I just wanted to point them out to you so you can begin to start identifying them for yourself in poems. And there is some end stopping as well that sort of helps us understand these images. Um, so there's sort of 11 distinct images, 11 lament for the, followed by an image. Um, and uh, Clark uses the punctuation to keep it really clear which image she's focusing on at each point of the poem. So let's go through it stanza by stanza, looking at these techniques. So stanza one focuses on the image of the turtle, the pregnant turtle. Um, we know that because there's words such as turtle, um, breeding ground, eggs, and nest. Um, we have that anaphora of for, so lament for the green turtle. That implies that the green turtle's actually died as a result, um, so we're lamenting it, it's gone. Um, even more tragic, it's a lament for her eggs. The unborn turtles are probably going to die because um, turtles, as far as I know, 
when they lay eggs, they come out of the sea, they um, sort of walk and wade onto the sandy beach, they dig a hole in the sand and lay their eggs in the sand until the eggs mature and, and hatch, and then the baby turtles go back into the sea. But what's happened is because of the war, there's been so many oil spills. Um, the Middle East is, is quite a wealthy place because of oil. Um, but all this oil was spilt during the Gulf War that actually the, the beautiful blue sea and the beautiful golden sand is turned into sort of a black, gooey, oily muck. So what's happening is the sea turtle is laying her eggs in the sand full of oil. And this oil is probably corroding the eggshells or when, when the baby turtles hatch. The first thing they breathe and inhale is oil, and the chances are that they're going to die. Um, and there's a real contrast of life and death imagery. In um, line one of this stanza, um, the turtle's pregnancy is referred to as pulsing. Um, a pulse is an indication you are alive. Um, you can find your pulse on your wrist or your neck. Um, anything that has a pulse, as, as if it's an animal, it means it's alive. Now contrast this with line three and the nest of sickness. Um, the noun sickness, if you're sick, um, you're, you're not in good health, you may actually end up dying. So we have a contrast of life in pulsing, the verb pulsing, and uh, death in the noun sickness. Um, and this really shows that nature and humanity's conflict are against each other. If we leave mother nature alone, she's capable of producing life. Um, however, because of our involvement with the Gulf War, we are capable of producing sickness. Um, and I think that's made really clear here by Clark. Just to point out, the end stopping helps you identify the two separate images. So the first image focuses on the green turtle and its death. And then in line two, we have a full stop that stops that image. And then we get the second uh, image of the eggs that also die. And we know um, that image stops with the full stop after sickness as well. So in stanza two, we move on to the imagery of the cormorant. The cormorant is a seabird. Again, we have the anaphora for the cormorant. So add the title to the beginning, you get lament for the cormorant. That again implies that this cormorant is dead. Now we get loads of techniques in stanza two. Um, let's start off with the metaphor of funeral silk. Um, so in England in particular, it's traditional at a funeral to dress all in black. Now this cormorant is a proud seabird. I imagine it maybe sat on the beach, looking out over the sand and the sea, expecting to see blue sea and golden sand, but instead it sees black murky waves and black gungy sand. And it is mourning, it is attending a, a funeral. Um, now the bird itself isn't wearing a black tuxedo or a black dress that you might wear to a funeral. It is wearing black oil. It's um, covered in, in oil, its feathers are all stuck and clumped together, and it's looking really sad over its natural environment. Um, this is further expressed in the second line of this stanza with the metaphor of veil of iridescence. So at a funeral, sometimes women wear a black veil over their face. Um, so when they cry over the person who has died, you know, other people don't sort of see them. It, it protects their dignity, as it were. Um, this veil is metaphorical because the beach and the sea is veiled, is covered in oil. Now, iridescence is actually quite a nice word. Um, iridescent sort of means colorful and shiny. I don't know if you've ever walked to school and you've, especially on a rainy day, um, and the rain has sort of washed some oil out from underneath a car and it's got that purpley, greeny, shiny effect. That's what iridescence is. Um, so the beach is covered in this purpley, greeny, shiny effect. It is kind of beautiful in a way, but because it's caused by oil, it's, it's absolutely devastating for the environment. I want to point out assonance. Assonance is a repeating of a vowel sound. Um, so veil of iridescence, we've got the E and the I sound that's repeated and it draws our attention to this metaphor. Uh, we also have alliteration of natural images. The S in silk, the S in sand, the S in shadow, the S in sea. Um, these are all very beautiful or should be beautiful natural images. But when you contrast them with this funeral image, the funeral silk, the, f the funeral veil, even the idea of a shadow, which represents the oil on the sea, but even shadows being 
dark um, and funerals being dark events. You get a real contrast of the beauty of nature. Silk is soft and beautiful. Sand is golden and beautiful. Um, the sea is, is blue and beautiful. But because of human, humanity's effect, humanity's conflict, we've turned beautiful nature into a funeral. The silk is black, uh, the sand is black, the sea has got a black shadow of oil on it. Um, and we know that alliteration, um, when we alliterate the S sound in poems, we can call it sibilance. Um, so that's a repeated S sound. So we have the S in silk, sand, shadow, sea, and it draws our attention um, to this contrast of imagery. Um, I just want to point out that C is one of those ideas that gets repeated throughout the poem, so as we read on um, through the next stanzas, uh, just identify where you see the sea or the ocean repeated. There it is. Ocean is repeated in stanza three. So clearly the sea, the ocean is a very important image, not just for Clark, um, but, but environmentally it's one of the most important assets of the planet. Um, so stanza three deals with three sort of different images. Um, it centers around the oil spill. So for the ocean's lap with its mortal stain, here the stain is the oil that is, is on the surface of the sea. Uh, the adjective mortal is interesting. If you're immortal, you live forever, you cannot be killed. Um, mortal means you, you can die. So here, the oil spill is a mortal stain, it's a deadly stain, it's going to kill life forms in the sea and around the sea. Um, and the sea has been personified here, which I find quite interesting. So the oil stain is on the ocean's lap. Now the ocean doesn't have a lap, but humans have a lap. And when we give a human quality to a non-human object, we call that personification. And the lap is a really interesting body part to choose. Um, think of a human mother, when she sat down with her baby, where does she put the baby? Usually on her lap, because um, that's a very protective, comfortable position. So in my head, I imagine Mother Nature, this sort of green goddess, holding the earth in her lap. She's protecting the earth. But unfortunately, because of humanity's conflict, we have inflicted a mortal stain on her baby, planet Earth. Um, our war has been so destructive that her baby is dying. And I find that a really, really sad image. Okay, the second line of the stanza deals with Ahmed at a closed border. Um, Ahmed is a traditionally Arabic name. Um, in my head, Ahmed is probably from Kuwait, um, and he's trying to flee the effects of the war. Uh, maybe his house was bombed, his business lost, you know, loved ones dying. Um, so he tries to flee into a nearby country, but all the borders are closed. He's trapped in this living hell of warfare. Again, really horrible image, deadly image, actually. Um, and the third line is for the soldier with his uniform on fire. As I mentioned, um, that was based on a real incident that happened where a soldier's tank um, exploded, I assume because of a missile, and the soldier escaped um, being burnt alive. Whether they died immediately or, or died later is unknown, but we can be we can assume they died because of the anaphora of four, for the ocean's lap, um, lament for Ahmed who presumably died. Lament for the soldier who probably died of his, his burn wounds. Um, we know the ocean gets repeated um, as well because it's a very important image for Clark in this poem. And the end stopping um, tells us when one image is over. So for the ocean's lap with its mortal stain, full stop. We're, we're done focusing on the deadly image of the ocean. We then move on to Ahmed, full stop. We focus on the deadly image of, of Ahmed. For the soldier of his uniform on fire, full stop. Um, we've focused on the soldier and the deadly image of him being burnt alive. So we move on to stanza four, and we get introduced to a different technique, listing. Listing is, is when you put many ideas or many words of the same class in a row. So gunsmith, armorer, boy fusilier, farmer's sons, um, they would all belong to the semantic field of, of military positions or people. Um, and the effect of listing sort of exaggerates the effect of war. Um, so, for example, if Clark just wrote, this is a lament for the gunsmith, 
the reader might think, oh, well, only one person's died, it's not too bad. But by saying gunsmith and then listing armourer and fusilier and sons, um, Clark is trying to exaggerate and emphasise just how widespread the effect of humanity's conflict is. So this stanza is focused on images of people, um, and what I want to identify for you is that there is a contrast of people. Um, a gunsmith is someone who works with guns. This is the sort of person you'd expect to find in the Gulf War. Um, an armourer is someone who works with armour. Again, these are people who have chosen to be in the military, they've chosen to work in war zones. They'd be expected to be in the army. But then we get a boy fusilier. Fusilier is like a, a military rank and position, but the word boy is really interesting. It implies this person's young, maybe a teenager, maybe just out of school. And they joined the army for the company. Maybe this young boy had quite a lonely childhood. Maybe they didn't enjoy school, they were bullied. So they decided to join the army for company, to, to have a group of friends, some brothers in arms. That's why they've joined. And now they've flown off to Iraq or Kuwait to join the war effort, and they've died. We know they've died because it's a lament for the boy Fusilier. That's a really sad, tragic loss of life. Again, the farmer's sons. Um, you don't normally associate farmer's sons with war, but this farmer's son uh, wanted to join the army, and they were in it for the music. So maybe the marching band, or maybe some of those parties that the army throws um, with, you know, singing and dancing and, and alcohol in, in sort of tents and stuff. Um, that really attracted the farmer's son, who might have been a bit bored with his quiet, rural farmer's life. Um, so he wanted a bit of fun in his life, got flown out to Kuwait or Iraq, and met uh, his end. Um, again, really tragic. So there's a real contrast of people affected by the war. Um, soldiers, like gunsmiths and armourers you'd expect, and sort of people you wouldn't expect. Boys, sons, who've signed up for an adventure and um, have unfortunately lost their life because of it. Uh, the next stanza deals with sea creatures. Um, lament for the hooked beak turtle, so uh, another species or type of turtle. Um, the dugong, a dugong is like a manatee or a sea cow. Um, dolphins and the whales. Again, this is listing. So Clark is getting across that this war hasn't just affected one creature, just turtles. It's affected a whole ecosystem of animals. Turtles, dugongs, dolphins, whales, all the fish in between have been affected because of the human conflict, the Gulf War. Um, so that is listing. Uh, that final line of this stanza, the whale struck dumb by the missile's thunder. There's lots you could talk about here. Um, the verb struck is quite violent. Um, whales breathe air, so every now and then they have to come to the surface to get fresh air, um, and it was struck by a missile. Um, in my head, I can almost imagine the whale breaching for air and the missile impacting. Um, I find that quite a violent image. Uh, dumb. The word dumb here doesn't mean sort of academically not very smart. Dumb means silent. Um, it, it used to be a way to describe people who were mute. Um, I think it's quite a derogatory way. Um, it's, it's, you, we shouldn't use that anymore. We should use the word mute. But dumb here means silent. Um, so whales sing. They make um, whale song, which can be heard for miles around in the water. But because the missile has struck the whale and killed the whale, the whale cannot sing anymore, it's gone silent. So the beauty of nature, um, nature makes music for us, um, but we can't listen to it because we've, we've bombed it all to death because of our human conflict. Um, and we have this uh, metaphor of missiles thunder, and this is sort of where humanity and nature collide. So missiles are man-made projectiles that explode, ballistic projectiles, um, and thunder is, is a natural um, sound that we get in storms. Um, so this is sort of where humanity and nature meets. Our missiles sound like nature's thunder, um, but where nature's thunder is, is sort of natural and beautiful and benefits the environment, uh, our humans' missiles don't. They destroy the whales, they reduce them, they silence them. Um, Mother Nature suffers because of humanity's missiles' thunder. 
Moving on to the penultimate, second to last stanza, um, we have seabird imagery. So again, the anaphora of for the, lament for the turn. We can assume the turn is dead. Um, not only the turn, but the gull and the wader. Um, so again, we have our third set of lists. We had a list of uh, different humans who were affected. We had a list of different sea creatures who were affected. Now we have a list of different seabirds um, that have been affected through no fault of their own, but through the fault of humans and their conflict, particularly between Iraq, Kuwait, USA, and UK. Um, we get a sort of interesting use of adjectives here. So the birds are lucky. They get to migrate away. They can do a long migration away from the Middle East to escape this battle. Um, however, there's still a slow dying. Now, whether that refers to the birds slowly dying or the birds flying over the Middle East and seeing the people below slowly dying, maybe they're watching not just the people, but the ecosystem slowly dying. I think the adjectives long and slow here really sort of draw out the suffering, which is quite unusual because the Gulf War was a very short war as far as wars go. It lasted about a month, just over a month. However, the effects are long and slow, particularly to the environment. I mean, the soldiers, the humans, probably died fairly quickly um, with the gunfire and the missiles, um, but nature took a long time to recover, and it was a slow recovery, lots of dying and suffering. So those are interesting adjectives. Um, we get that repetition of sun. So not only is the ocean important, the sea, but the sun is very important as well. And this image gets repeated again in the final stanza. Um, so poets usually repeat ideas or images that they think are really important. So clearly the ocean and the sun is important to Clark. And we get the use of senses. Um, so with imagery in poems, most images are visual. They use your sense of sight. Um, but here Clark is encouraging us to use our sense of smell, the stink of anger. What does anger smell like? Um, it might be different for everyone, but I can tell you what anger smells like in terms of the Gulf War. It probably smells like oil spill. It probably smells like soldiers' uniforms being burnt. It probably smells like human flesh being burnt. Um, it probably smells like animals dying and rotting. It probably smells like hot desert sand covered in oil. Um, that is the smell of anger. And it's quite a powerful use of senses to engage the reader. So we move on to our final stanza, and in my opinion, the most horrific and the one that makes me stop and think the most, the most impactful on me. Um, and in the seventh stanza, we get apocalyptic imagery. So the apocalypse, um, the idea comes from uh, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and it's sort of about how the world comes to an end. And the Bible gives hints, there's certain things that happen. So um, the earth will suffer from heat, the sun gets blocked out, um, you know, there's, there's tsunamis and natural disasters and, and sort of suffering. And a lot of those things, worryingly, I find in this poem. Um, and Clark found all of these ideas uh, her inspiration for the poem from newspaper clippings of the war. So what is really concerning for me is that humans' ability to bring about apocalyptic events such as the burnt earth, the adjective burnt. I mean, if you've ever burnt your toast or cooking your pizza or whatever, you know it's inedible. There's nothing left. Burning is destroying. The earth has been destroyed, not by Mother Nature, but by humans' conflict. Uh, the sun has been put out. Put out is a phrasal verb. A phrasal verb is when you have um, a verb, like put, next to a preposition, like out, and it changes the meaning. Put out um, doesn't mean you put something outside. It means that the sun has been blocked out, extinguished. Um, if there's no sun, there's no heat. We would enter a, a sort of eternal winter and probably all freeze to death. Plants wouldn't grow. Um, our ecosystems would be destroyed. So again, the sun is being repeated throughout the poem. We see it in stanza six and in stanza seven. It's clearly a very important image for Clark and a very important part of our ecosystem. We then move on to the scalded ocean. Um, if something is scalding, that's a verb, by the way. Um, if something is scalding, it's, it's hot. Um, when I was younger, I accidentally scalded my arm with oil, so I spilt um, like 
boiling oil on my arm and it really hurt. So the image here is that the ocean is boiling and bubbling like hot oil. Uh, now the ocean's meant to have a certain temperature to sustain, you know, life. Um, but if it starts boiling and bubbling, you know, all the sea creatures are dead. Um, our environment, our ecosystem goes out of order. Um, humans probably don't survive if the earth, if the ocean starts boiling. Um, we get the image of the blazing well. Blazing here is an adjective. Um, a well is when you dig into the ground for a source of water. Now we know that water is probably one of the most important things to humans. Um, oxygen and water have got to be up there with, with the two most important things. If a well gets on fire, that means the core of the earth is so hot, it's been heating up, that all the water is starting to boil in the well. So that means it will all turn into steam, so when you send your bucket down the well, there's no water to draw up and drink. And if humans don't have water, very soon we would die out. So this is a really scary image of the end of the earth. You know, humans are not surviving. Um, and the irony is, we've started it all. Mother Nature had the earth in her lap and was looking after it. But humanity, with all its war and conflict, has, has destroyed it so much that, that it doesn't support our life anymore. Um, the ocean also gets repeated, so we get the idea of the ocean or the sea in stanzas 2, 3 and 7, so clearly an important image for Clark, an important part of our environment and our planet. And this final line is really interesting, lament for vengeance. Vengeance is a noun that means revenge. Um, who's getting revenge here? Is it Iraq getting revenge on Kuwait? Is it the USA and the UK getting revenge on Iraq? Is it, more worryingly, planet Earth, Mother Nature, getting revenge on humanity, saying, look, you have bombed and missiled and destroyed the Earth so much, you've destroyed all the animals, the sea creatures, the seabirds, that actually, I, Mother Nature, am going to turn myself into an inhospitable place for you. It's going to be a place of burnt Earth, no sun, boiling oceans, dry wells, and actually, I'm going to get my revenge on you, humanity. And the result of my revenge on you is that your language, one of the most important things about being human, being able to communicate, will soon turn into the noun ashes. If you find ashes of anything, that thing is destroyed. If a house is turned into ashes, it doesn't look like a house. If um, a body, once it's di it died and it's been cremated, turns into ashes, it doesn't resemble a body. Um, your language won't resemble anything. Humanity will be destroyed by Mother Nature's vengeance, revenge, because of what you've done with your conflicts. What a really powerful image and thought to end the poem on. So, um, please make some notes from this video on a physical copy of the poem to aid your revision. Um, and if you want to, have a go at answering the question, how does Clark explore the effects of conflict on the world in Lament? Um, you really, you, got, you should focus on all the different types of images Clark uses. She's a really great poet for snapshot imagery in this poem. So start by introducing the poem, the message, maybe a bit about the Gulf War. Um, then look at the language used. You've got things like um, personification, alliteration, listing you could explore. Um, you might want to look at the structure, the seven stanzas, the tersets, the elegy form. Um, you may want to look at some poetic features as well, particularly the anaphora of for, lament for the something, or maybe how the use of end stopping helps capture these images. Um, and then finally, draw some kind of conclusion. What is the effect of conflict on the world? Um, I would argue your answer should probably sound something like this, um, that humanity's conflict has had a negative effect on the world. Um, so, if you enjoyed this video and found it useful, please give it a like. Uh, please consider subscribing to my channel so you get all of my poetry um, analysis videos. And feel free to leave a comment if you think there's anything I missed out or you would like to share. Well, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you on the next one.